so I actually have recently been getting back into the Nancy Drew games. They were a huge um, series for me in my childhood. I played probably about 10 of them. And then I recently, like last, maybe two weeks ago, I started playing Curse of Blackmore Manor again, and I beat that. And then I went back to the first one, started playing Secrets Can Kill, and I beat that. And then I recently just went on a like two-week escapade trying to figure out how to install the second game, Stay Tuned for Danger. Uh, because it was not supported really on uh, Windows 10 unless you did like a, a couple weird things and you had to install certain things and whatever. So yeah, it's basically like a point and click adventure mystery narrative puzzle game. Um, but yeah, that's been a lot of fun for me lately. A lot of people can relate to this, but um, as soon as you start kind of working and making games, um, it can sometimes be really hard to appreciate playing them <laughs> um, because it feels a little bit too close to home sometimes. Um, but that said, I of course love um, a ton of different games. Um, I think simulation is one of my favorite genres. Uh, definitely adventure game is probably my, my favorite genre. Lately I've been playing somewhat similar to, to Chris, kind of doing a throwback, and maybe it's just because we're working on a, a similarly inspired project. Um, but I've been playing a lot of the Humongous Entertainment games, and they worked on a number of games. They did the the backyard sports, the backyard baseball, and the, um, the backyard football, and all these things. But they also did um, a lot of really great family adventure games. Um, and so they did the Putt-Putt series, and the Spy Fox series, and um, all kinds of games like that. So I've been playing through their library. Um, and then I also have been playing, um, I'm a huge fan of golf games, golf video games. I, I've never played golf in real life, but I love video games. Um, and so I've been playing the, uh, I think it's the Clap Hands. Um, they developed the Hot Shots Golf Series, um, but I've been playing their latest title on Apple Arcade. Uh, and so that's been kind of my my enjoyment after work. So I have been playing a lot of video games over the course of COVID because it's pretty much like the only way that I've been able to stay in touch with my friends. Um, so I spent an ungodly amount of time playing World of Warcraft and kind of burned out on that. And I played a little bit of The Division. I played a little bit of Destiny. And recently I've been super into Outriders. It's, I, I really love it. It's so much fun. Um, and it's, it's just been a really nice way to like, you know, stay in touch with some of my friends that I've had for years that live a couple states away, um, who I can't see in person. And it's almost every night we'll get on and we'll like, you know, run through some stuff together. It's a lot of fun. I think Babs might be my favorite part because she is so snarky, but also so helpful. And I, I found like when I first read through the script, she was the person that I was laughing at or like laughing with the most. Um, and she's also a really useful resource in the game, which there, you know, there's there's tons of resources, but she's one you can really go to and count on that like you're gonna get some help and figure out something. Um, so yeah, I think I think Babs is the final answer. <laughs> uh, I think my favorite part of Code Tycoon is probably the hacking terminal interface. I, uh, when originally it was asked to put that in, I was pretty nervous as to like what was expected out of it. Um, but then once we had the foundation in, I love just making like custom developer like hacks to just make my life easier. And I just had fun putting stuff into it that we could, you know, use on our end and also the user gets to experience too. So that was cool. I love all the mini games. Um, but I think probably the Token Factory minigame is probably my favorite. Um, just because as we were designing that, it was really cool, first of all, how the design was trying to capture the mechanics of how OAuth would, would kind of operate. Um, but then also just as we were designing it, um, we were like, wow, this could be like a full game, <laughs> like completely like as a standalone thing, because it's the mechanics I think are really interesting. We went to these really wild like design inspirations, looking at games like Papers, Please, and um, some really interesting designs to kind of come up with the mechanics. And then um, the way the aesthetics came together with really cool shaders and visual effects was awesome. And then I think out of all the music tracks, that's probably like my favorite music track we have in the game too. So I think everything just kind of coalesced into the Token Factory game, uh, probably my favorite part.
I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, so feel free to cut it out and post, but um, save the hamster. Don't let... Just... <laughs> <laughs> don't let the distractions uh, like ruin your game. And, and so, I mean, like, try your best to manage all the, the distractions. Definitely try your best to fix the printer, but if the printer breaks for like the millionth time, <laughs> it might just be time to kind of let that go. And uh, and yeah, just try and get as much work done as you can uh, doing your actual job in Code Tycoon. Um, and then also definitely make sure and use uh, the items in your backpack um, because there's some really useful items in there that will help you kind of block out some of the distractions. And that's going to be really important uh, if you actually want to make progress. We left a lot of the debug tools in the hacking terminal. So if you play around in there for a long time, trying out things that you think might be interesting or would work, they might actually work. Um, I think we left like all the debug tools in there. So you have to know what the commands are, but uh, you could access them and then theoretically do a lot of things. So this is like a more development-centered um, series, but in terms of the art, um, I think one thing that I really loved about this project was working with a really cool mix of two-dimensional art and three-dimensional art. Um, we kind of went back and forth for the longest time trying to figure out what aesthetic we wanted to make this project and going back and forth between do we want 3D characters, do we want 3D environments, how do we want to do all this? and we ended up settling on having these 2D characters um, that have these cool 2D animations and everything, but they move around in 3D space. And we decided to, to go with a 3D environment because um, we wanted to make sure that it was really flexible because we weren't really sure how the environment should be laid out and what it would feel like to actually move around it. And so we wanted to make that really flexible and modular. And so uh, having that be a 3D space that we could modify and uh, in our production pipeline, working in 3D is actually a little bit faster um, than creating like individual sprites for the 2D environments. So coming up with the balance between doing 3D environment, 2D characters, but then having the 2D characters do like pathfinding and AI navigation around the environment and having that all tie in with their animation system. Um, and then on top of that, having it all tie in with um, a pretty robust character creator system that we have for the player. Um, layering all those elements uh, was a really big challenge, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. And I think it creates a pretty cool aesthetic um, that I'm really proud of. I guess I wanted to say that I was just really proud in general. This project was like a really fast timeline. Uh, it's the fastest I think anyone at Gossamer has worked on. I think it was slightly less than six months, like five and a half months or something, uh, to make a full uh, shippable game with a lot of aspects that we had never worked on before, like online integration uh, and cloud saves and more narrative focus and uh, with like loading up mini games in the background while it's time-based and it's a strategy game. So it was like a lot of different things that we hadn't necessarily worked on that were challenging, all in like a five and a half month timeline. Um, and I feel like we did really well uh, for that timeline. I feel like we, I feel like I learned about myself in that like how much I am able to accomplish, I guess, in a certain amount of time. Um, yeah, so I feel like we did a really good job and I feel like we were able to work really quickly. And I think that was really cool to learn as a team, I guess. Echoing kind of Chris, I mean, it, we we this is probably an obscenely short period of time uh, to develop a game. I think we all kind of felt like we we uh, would have loved to have six more months <laughs> um, to to do more. And and just the every single time, you know, we we had an issue with with whether it was you know the hosting or the security or you know something that at least that I was involved in. You know, Chris was uh, able to just you know quickly just uh, you know either find a fix or or uh, you know. Um, you know, resolve an issue just just with cloud saves, for example, you know, we found right at the beginning of early access, uh, we found that there was an issue when you 
logged in in a certain way, uh, it, it, there was there was an issue, a conflict of some kind uh, with your cloud saves and our ability to push, you know, what was currently in your cookies uh, up to the uh, up to play fab while pulling down a save. Um, Chris was able to get to the bottom of that just really quickly, um, and and you know, I, I was just extremely impressed with that. So I'm I'm really proud of the team, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm of course very proud of of what we produced, but um, just just the, the team as a whole, I I, I thought it was uh, pretty awesome.